will it happen in my kid's lifetime? Will my kid be living in a world which is very much different than what I am doing? I totally believe in that. I still believe in the ingenuity of the human spirit to come up with something that's more like for all the things that the internet did, we found out a way to still survive, thrive. All right. I think we, we camped on our original research for a while. You said you wanted to touch on your one more thing. Yeah, one more thing on the original research. So I think the big thing with the original research, and this is going to be a through line for, I think, a lot of stuff that we talk about, is it's the, the constant need to produce, right? There's there's the original research part, which we as content marketers know that we need to have, but then there's also the challenges of getting to first party beta, right? I've worked with companies where it's like, let's use this first party data. We talked about this last night. Let's use first party data. And then the legal teams are like, no, we can't do that. Or the sec ops teams are like, no, we can't do that. And it's like, yeah, but we want to look good. And this is something that we feel like we need to have. So can't we just, and I, I think what becomes a challenge for me overall, right? It's not just the, the need to produce, but it's the difference between production and craft. And if you're able to like really craft your stuff, I think that leads to a lot more creative fulfillment. And if you're forced in a position by the business to not do craft-based things, then it leads to, I think what we're seeing in a lot of the space right now, there's a lot of malaise happening in the entire mm -hmm. content space. And I think that's one of many other factors that's causing that because people aren't able to go like, I really want to do this really cool study. It's like, yeah, you can, but not really. Yeah, I feel like to a certain degree, as long as you get, I think if you say, I want to do this cool thing, or I have this great idea, or it'll make our brand look great, like, no one's going to care, that's not actually a very good reason to do it. I think, like, <laughs> like I think that's like, but like, if you're going to risk customer data, or if you're going to risk violating contracts, all these other things, like, I understand why those teams are, like, hesitant. Uh, oh, for sure. But for me, it's like, if you position the research as this is helping our customers to be more successful, do you not want our customers to be more successful? It's kind of a hard thing for legal to then go, yeah, I actually don't want more successful product, like customers that are going to use our product better. Yeah. So like, honestly, I'd rather, I'd rather have headcount of CSMs and customer service reps talking about what they've noticed rather than using research. And I think like a lot of the times like people position in marketing as like, this would be cool. Like I'm in this boat. I've often like position, put pitch stuff. And it's like, this would be dope. Like we should do this. <laughs> yeah. This would be fun. Like we have cool data. Let's, I love data. Let's look at the data. And then people are like, yeah, that's great, Sam. Like we're not going to do that. But if it's like, we can make our customers more successful, they can make better videos. They can make better content. They can do that. It's like people are going to obviously jump on the board to help you a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> and like your your job as a leader is take those dope ideas from your team and you would sometimes be like the executive translator. Yes. To make <laughs> that yeah. buy in. And I think if you're young, if you're early in your career, you need to make sure the person above you is good at that. Because yeah. you don't get to do that. Yep. Uh, I would love to. You mentioned the malaise in the content space, and this is one of the factors. I mean, yeah. I'm interested in what you think the other factors are. Oh, God. Um, I mean, it's it's... <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a lot of stuff I mean it's the the over I've been I'm actually about to do an original research project on this um how much pee hacking is involved no pee hacking is involved um I have very set control set of questions that I'm going to be asking no it's um I mean a lot of it's the the over reliance on SEO uh is one of the things people don't feel like they're getting um the the ability to go deeper in the work i think the other part is definitely the ai conversation i know a lot of freelance writers right now are going shoot this is actually better than me mm -hmm. um covering these very basic uh topics right mm -hmm. because we're not going deeper we're not using controlling ideas we're not talking about wants we're not or we're talking about wants but we're not addressing underlying needs like all the stuff i was saying earlier this is all stuff that either we don't have the language for to communicate like this is what makes good stuff mm -hmm. or we don't have the ability to or the freedom to uh go deeper than that because you have a leader right above you going like well what's the other guy doing mm -hmm. right and i i i mean i've worked with i've worked in and i've worked with very large organizations and it's always like 
you know, yeah, that seems like a really cool idea, but is somebody else doing it? Mm -hmm. No, they're not doing it right now. So like it, the idea hasn't been validated by somebody. And then the other part is, is like, I think a lot of creators or leaders also don't have the frameworks to communicate like, Hey, yeah, nobody else is doing this, but this is why it will be successful. Mm -hmm. A lot of like, from what I've seen, it's, um, this would be cool. Nobody else is doing it. So we should do it. And it's like, yeah, but there's no validation mm -hmm. as to like why that will actually hit. And there's like, it's all about the presentation, right? Like you were just saying, it's all about, you're, you have to sell the idea. Mm -hmm. But if you can't sell the idea with like, no, there's no actual evidence that, you know, running a media brand is going to be the thing that's going to work, but you can go, but people here like this and people here like that. And then there's stuff over here that's kind of it's not in our industry but it's like mm -hmm. it's in the field of view like mm -hmm. of what they would like like i don't know um i think there's a lot of restriction on folks and a lot of content marketers are being put into a box do you guys feel the same idea you scared to say i own the thing like <laughs> so i certainly don't feel like i'm in a box uh, that i i feel like i overwhelm our team because i'm like do this no 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 except about this team team yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you say uh and so i i definitely have like squat syndrome mm -hmm. uh and so hearing you talk about kip i was just like um i wish i was <laughs> before i would like stick to something for an entire year <laughs> it's just like beat the drum because i know that's effective so but I, I think it's like there's also some art to figuring out what's a big enough thing that we could be a drum of all year where there's a lot of room to play inside of that overarching objective and i don't know that i'm good i, I, I know i'm not great that do you feel i'm related to anybody i sure sometimes <laughs> but like you know like, the about the ladies like to me it's like <laughs> just, maybe not personally we're content marketers complaining about their job 10 years ago yeah you know what I mean? Where content marketers complaining about their job five years ago? Yeah. Were they 15 years ago? Yeah. Like they always complain. There's nothing unique about they, it. They, no they, yeah. Like to me, like our people be like, my boss isn't letting me be creative. Like, okay. You know, like, you like, saying that, like, like this feels ever present. What about, yeah. Now? What about this moment? Like this moment, yeah. I think, like, I think there's more of a general malaise against like society. Like, people are like, <laughs> I, I think people are like sad about the way things are going. I think people feel like the jobs are not what jobs used to be. I feel like people don't feel like the companies that they work for are as committed to their development and growth. Mm -hmm. And that's where the malaise comes from. I don't think the malaise comes from like the malaise. There's no new thing about somebody feeling like I tried to write something creative and then they wanted me to write mm -hmm. something boring. Yeah. Like yeah. that's like journalism from like every year. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> since every, journalism like was ever, since like Ben Franklin is like, you know, like he's like, <laughs> I'm going to write something slightly more creative because no one else was, you know, like, so I just don't think like the malaise, like, yeah, I get it. But I think it's more of just like a, uh, all jobs feel malaise. I think all people feel like, there's less uh, control over their life and like they feel like their jobs are not progressing in the way that they would like them to. I mean, I think the other part of that is though, is like the mass layoffs that have been happening. So it's like this whole, I can't do what I want to do or I don't like, and yes, everybody's felt, any creative has felt that for forever. And you're like, you're done, right? But the other part of that is going, my job is constantly on the line. They just cut our learning and development budgets. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's, I can't do what it is I want to do and I might get laid off because I'm not also able to put the creative output out that they want me to create, right? So there's this like, you're stuck in this like little middle zone and it's like, I, I think a lot of content and then also like I get replaced by a robot like, very easily mm -hmm. and I don't know how to make the argument against that without mm -hmm. being, you know, one way or the other. So I, I think that that's, that's part of it. And with that, with this particular moment in time, I think the malaise is around me. like AI, it's around the creative aspect of it, like, and the also I could lose my job at any moment. But like, you know, and then there are other people I think we're we're seeing is now more people are starting their own thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think for me, in my opinion, right, I think especially with AI coming in, too much content is going to become a big problem. Yes. So we could it's already even without AI, it was a very big problem. Yeah. 
And uh, I think we need to innovate. And innovation, I think, really happens in human connection. Uh, we need to do more of this, like this, yes. right? AI cannot do this, right? The organic conversations that come out of become AI cannot do that. And that having chatting with people one on one in whichever setting, it could be this setting. Sometimes I go for a hike and I chat with them yep. in a hike setting, right? When guards are down, people are relaxed. Having a conversation, bringing your authentic self. I think those are the things I'd like to see more of. So, yeah. So. yeah. You had a you had a comment yesterday about something you called take flation. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> now everybody can have a take. Before it was like the the news anchors or the the I guess the commentators, you know, on TV were the only ones that could have a take. But now we all can pull out our phone and, and have a take, which brings down the value of everyone's take because everyone can have one now. Elaborate on that idea. Like, uh, where, where is this help you? But my takes are good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I had picked it up from this uh, Isla Scanlon, who's like an economics kind of influencer, reporter, creator person. Uh, but like, idea simply too many takes chasing the same number of topics. And I think, like, if you look at stuff on the internet, uh, every year, every week, everything is changing all the time. People will say the most ridiculous things that make like no sense. Google's going to lose 25% of its traffic by the end of the year to chat GPT based on nothing. You know, like nothing, no data, whatever. Apple really screwed up Siri. You know, like they really messed it up. Okay, it's only like the most popular, well-known voice assistant in the world, globally. People's takes are like untethered from reality <laughs> to the point that they are so absurd that like the idea, like, is that what because you have to do it. You yeah. have to do it because like, what am I, am I going to post something that's like, Oh, yeah, you know, SEO is good and bad. There's upsides and downsides. Kind of depends. <laughs> Which is like the more accurate answer. Clip that. But like, it's like much better to say it's going to die. Everything's ruined if you don't, blah, blah, blah. So I just think like the idea of takeflation is like once the things that speed it up, especially I think in B2B right now, is before there wasn't a way to make money off of your takes, right? Like in like other areas, like if you were predominantly on YouTube, if you were predominantly on other areas, like, and you were doing T channels or something like that, where you're talking about other influencers, like you could make money from that. Mm -hmm. You couldn't really make money off of following at B2B till a few years ago. Now you can make way more money through like affiliate links on software. Now you can monetize your audience through like sponsored content. Like there were people paying for people with over 10,000 followers on LinkedIn. Now there are people paying for it. And so like, I think, one, you had an incentive early in B2B to make takes because it made your job, it gave you job security. Now it's added a second layer where you have like a monetary value to your takes. Mm -hmm. Like not only is it a professional value, it's a monetary value if you reach a certain point. So that's just going to keep accelerating takes. And like, I think you see it in certain areas like um, makeup influencers. Right. Like makeup influencers grew to large areas all of a sudden. And then you have like people who create takes about those makeup influencers because there's much more of an incentive mm -hmm. around. Yeah. And so I think it'd be to be like what you're going to see is the same thing play out now that there's a way to make money off of takes easily on a platform where people are, are LinkedIn. Like you're going to see people continue to say like crazier and crazier things like every day. So is your message to marketers basically? Be a critical thinker. Just be a critical thinker. Yeah. Just think, be open to the idea that everything is not changing. Yeah. Like, be like, again, like if you had asked me 10 years ago and you were like, if I had gone back 10 years ago to talk to my past self and I was like, sick, there's more social networks now. I'd be like, okay. That wouldn't shock me. I'd be like, oh, Sam, there's now uh, short form videos are really popular. Okay. Yeah. That sounds right. Google does things where it summarizes and answers at the top. All right, that sounds cool. I wouldn't be shocked by anything that's happening now. But if I looked at it from last week, it's like 
everybody drop everything you're doing. <laughs> Google summarizing answers at the top. This is going to change everything. Like, no, it's not. It's, no, it's, it's not going to change everything. Like, none of this would have shocked me before. None of these things would be like, oh my God, I got to kind of really change everything that I'm doing as a creator and as a marketer because like in 10 years, there's going to be a new platform where short form videos are popular. No. And so like, I think as a marketer, like you can get really nervous and like, I think you see it a lot in the fitness industry where people make you feel bad for things that you're not doing. Yeah. Like <laughs> I run this much. Are you lifting like this? That's terrible. Are you lifting like that? That's a good, you know, like, are you not running steps are good? Steps are stupid. And it's like geared towards like feeling bad. Yeah. And I think a lot of what B2B stuff is going to start leaning towards is making you feel bad for the decisions that you're doing. And I think like if you're a marketer, the thing that I like about thinking about takeflation is like, don't worry, like look at what's going on in your business, at your job. Yeah. And don't feel bad because somebody's giving some hot take that the work you're doing is is not worth it. Like if you're an SEO and you put years into working in that job and somebody's like SEO is bad, it's not, it shouldn't be a crisis for you. You shouldn't look at those things as evidence that like you're doing bad. And I think like marketing really beats itself up. It's like, oh, content's terrible. B2B is terrible. Like everything is ruined, blah, blah, blah. But like, I feel like marketing does a really good job. A lot of content that mm -hmm. people produce is really good. There is a lot of good stuff out there. I think they contribute to the business in a way that keeps making marketing departments money. Like we keep growing. I don't know. So to me, it's like, I think people, the reason I like thinking about takeflation is I think people are going to start encouraging others to feel worse yeah. when really you should recognize that there's incentives to creating that feeling. Yep. Yeah. And you know, as you mentioned something boss and I after dinner actually about like looking looking back a little bit and like you know there's nothing new under the sun this idea of like you know there's to your point like everybody's got to take on this new thing or this new like uh, oh we got to stay up to date with this new thing and uh with ai it's like oh we got to figure out how to integrate ai into everything that we're doing now and you're like you know like you look at like the original content marketing and disney actually nailed it like 75 80 years ago yeah. with like comic strips yeah that got people to come to disney yes it, elaborate a little bit. yeah so i think the uh, walt disney was the original uh master in marketing which you want to this day we are not been able to replicate and if you look at what they're marketing at the end of the day they want to market their theme parks and how are they marketing the theme parks they used comics to basically build their characters in our mind and they actually made us pay for it. Mm -hmm. Imagine you write a white paper and have people pay to write to read your white paper. Mm -hmm. But that was his genius. Mm -hmm. He made us do that. And then he produced stories. We watched. Ultimately, the goal, the success of the movie is measured not just by how much it makes in the box office, but how much money they make in the theme park, right? Every successful movie has a, a downstream benefit that comes from it. So in order to, so he made marketing a oh, profit center. Many times we look at marketing as a cost center because we have not been very innovative in how to monetize what we are creating marketing in, in marketing. Right. So we should in marketing think what we can do that people feel is a value add and actually people pay for something like that. You are doing a lot of original research, right? Part of the reason why we are not doing enough of original research is because the original research, the first research, the first time research is just given out for free. How about you do a report, like what the third fund does, and we actually have to pay to get paid for something like that, right? People value, and that research shouldn't come only from us, but maybe it should come from the industry experts that are out there. There are 400 people who are willing to give you their uh, their, bank, their input on a subject that is of importance to you, right? So people might be willing to pay for something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to flip this idea of marketing being a cost center to marketing being really a profit center or even driving value into the business beyond just uh, creating a business, right? I think this may was the best of it. There's actually a, a diagram that you wrote too that, that time, would be used right? for B-level, yeah. right? Like where it's, you know, the markers are right here, and then it's like 
cartoons, movies, merchandise, all of that. Um, George Lucas did the same thing, right? The movies weren't. Yeah, he he made um, the deal that he made with with the company or with the with Fox, I believe was that he would take fewer profits on the movies because he was going to do more money on the merchandise on the other side. And where Star Wars made all of its money yes. was on the merch, lunchbox and, and action figures and play sets. And space ball, the, the flint tire. Spa- yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I want to go back to something you said, you know, 10 years ago, right? If you were to tell yourself all the things that happened, you'd have like a general ambivalence to the prior to them. <laughs> you know, would. So, so what, what then, has there been anything in the past, in your career, where you're like, this does change things. Like, what has there ever been a kind of cataclysmic thing in your mind where you're like, what I did before will not work? Has there been a cataclysmic change? Been cataclysmic, but like, there's there's a dismissiveness to how you were addressing some things. Like, like yeah, more social service, whatever. I, I would, I'm obviously like leading the witness, but like, I think I don't think anyone rationally thinks. I need to stop the presses and change everything. Mm. But I also think to be naive to these either incremental or leap forward in the way people consume things or discover things, y- you'll be a dinosaur. Like if you're not careful. Like, yeah. There's people in the late 90s who are probably like direct mail, never going to die. Just going to do direct mail for the rest of my life. Don't need to worry about this internet thing. Right. So I'm, I'm curious how you've adjusted and when you have it. But you saw it happen in like the nature. Yeah. Right. I, I worked with old reporters who were like, People are going to love this print. People love the newspaper man deliver. They have, they love that relationship. It's never going away. Of course it will. Right. So I want to balance the Cassandra alarmist aspect of AI is going to take all of our jobs with head in the sand. I don't need to change anything. Yeah. I think it's like, for me, it's more like small things that add up over time to the actual person doing work. No, like there's no like spark where you so like for me, like, okay, like one of the things that I've been thinking about for video production, like making videos, mm-hmm. is like you before, if you wanted to get comments on a video, you would have to email it to a person. You'd have to go to like a shady website to like use one of those like send large file thing. Yeah. Send a large file, you'd send it to them, they would open it, they'd look at it, and they'd send back time based stamped comments mm-hmm. and email, right? Like mm-hmm. then that other person has to download it, blah, blah, blah. That's just a basic thing of getting feedback on a video that would mean you'd probably take like two or three hours to like get basic feedback of like a 20 minute video or something. Like mm-hmm. now it's a lot faster because you can use things like Frame.io or Wistia or things like that to do like time stamped comments. Is that a cataclysmic? change no but like that plus the ability to get transcripts Mm -hmm. plus the ability to do other things means that like cumulatively the view the time to produce a video has shortened and so it's like none of those are particularly exciting same thing with like workflow automations they slowly get better and then as they slowly get better, you're like, oh, now I actually looking at this thing a lot differently. Mm-hmm. We can make this a lot more nuanced. Mm-hmm. And so to me, it's like the things, no, no single thing changes hugely, like massively. Like even ChatGPT, I, like I can still, it's helping people write faster mm-hmm. somewhat. And I think ignoring its ability to help people write faster is like silly. But also, like, I don't think if you're a good writer, I think you could still outwrite it. Mm-hmm. I think I could still outresearch it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I just like there's other things with like video and other areas where it's like all those little small friction points along the way that affect the actual person doing the job. Like as those get removed, things change. So you're more of an incrementalist. Like, I'm like very yes, like, the stuff changes, but there's yeah, like, the stuff know. changes. It's not like hugely shocking, yeah. but like. It's the little things of like doing it where you're like, oh, wow, this actually makes it a lot easier, which now I think about it as like, oh, now that it's easier, does it change what I would produce? Mm-hmm. Like I before here, like for me, an example would be like, I would be hesitant maybe a uh, year, like a couple of years ago to have a lot of customer support people making videos. Right. But now it's like culturally, people are used to lower production videos. It's easier for them to make videos that are branded. So it's like, you want to go make a video and send it to your customer? Great. Same thing with like sales reps sending videos where it's like, I wouldn't have trusted if you were a marketing department, you'd be like, sales reps are making videos and sending them to people. Like, that's weird. Don't do that. 
And it's like, but now it's like, oh yeah, like it's easy for them to do that. They make a nice branded thing. It's like, it works out well. Like you could see analytics. And so it's like, no particularly big change there, but like incrementally though is add up. Or like, was it you though, know, right? Like Loon didn't come out and everyone wasn't like, holy crap, customer success is going to change forever. <laughs> yeah, but like when it permeates and slowly where you wake up two years later and you're like, oh, we all just, we just send loops. Yeah, we just, like, like, we still, yeah, we just yeah. send loops. It's yeah. not like a big deal. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you, you have a history background too. So like being able to see things in retrospect, like, the, the iterative stuff, it's like, oh, yeah, you've seen this before. Like, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is, um, are you familiar with George Lois? No, no. George Lois, famous ad man, right? Uh, cover of Esquire. Um, yeah. Did all the Esquire covers from, like, the 60s. Like, all your iconic Esquire covers. The war all being stuffed into a suit game. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, Muhammad Ali, like, you know, all, all of those, right? He also got into TV advertising. And he was responsible for I Want My MTV. Uh, and he did a number of uh, other ones, but the big one was Maypo, right? So this or oatmeal brand, and he used these big burly um, uh, athletes of the time, like these really masculine men, and they would all be like crying, like, I want my Maypo. <laughs> and his philosophy on this was that, and watch the movie Art and Coffee if you want to really dig deep into this. Um, his philosophy was people are channel surfing you need to grab their attention in that split second that it takes to get from one channel to the next and it's like how is that not the most relevant thing right now that we're doing this constantly and this is stuff that he was talking about you know in the in the 60s was his this is like every day is all his new i guess right. still back yeah to right. uh, like what disney did 75 years ago yeah I'm still like yeah and you, i mean I, I saw you know it was how like in 2013 they had their own repurposing roadmap and it looked exactly like that and now we're still talking about repurposing as if it's this brand new thing and it's like no we've been talking about this stuff in different applications for many many years yeah. print is making a comeback man like business to business companies are doing print magazines now because you know it's good so the whole idea of like print dying no it didn't die it just took another well, and it took us a while to come back to it. Mm -hmm. So you, if you had to go connect what you're saying to what the Disney idea was, yeah. like, the way to stop that channel stroll, I think you need to have multiple touch points. Yeah. Okay. So the genius of uh, Disney is they have multiple touch points. Mm -hmm. They never stuck only to movies. They never stuck only to the merchandise. They never stuck only to the theme park. It's the combination of those things. It's a multi-sensory experience, right? Mm -hmm. Over a period of time. Each one of us. So if you see what Disney did, we enjoy the movie, right? But if it was just a movie, it get reinforced when I go to the theme park and right. have that right myself, right? All those things. So similarly, if you want to do that, I think if you are an influencer, for example, on social media, right? How do you reinforce it? In some ways, what James is doing is reinforcing. I follow him on LinkedIn. I love his content. He brought us together. We had a great time, right? In some ways, I met people that I never met, right? Yeah. I'm like, that got reinforced. Can James now do something else to take it? Maybe can you do some merchandise, creator house merchandise? For example, when I came here, if there was a souvenir of creator house, I would love to take it home, keep it on my desk, and remember the great time that we had together, right? It's just like this, right? Just like this, right? So I think in order, of, in a world where there is channel surfing of TikTok surfing or Instagram surfing that's happening, going down, the way to stand out is to find more touch points for each one of us. And leaders be consistent, allow the pilot programs and things to take off. Like, you know, because Disney lost a lot of money. Well, yeah. Disney lost a lot of money before anything became successful. Yeah. And he saw it before anybody else did. Yes. And he lost other people's money. Yeah. Right. So, like, be willing to be consistent and not have just short-term bets. Are we naive to be like, we're Disney? <laughs> you know what I mean? wow. Like, to be comparing I'm myself, I was going to... No, it doesn't have to be Disney. No, we're any, like... Come on. Yeah, I think, yeah. yes, we don't have to spend millions of dollars. The example that I gave, on what James is doing in some way, a miniature version, a personal version of what... Right, okay. Right. Like, the social media, he brought us together. We have great experience. He had this and remind me to sit on my table. Every time I see that, it reminds me of the great time. The whiskey at any part is that incredible. <laughs> it's like just, whiskey, right? just like that. A journey through stats. <laughs> I think it's a it's a nod to creating experiences. And so you you just got done with the the crossbeam. Yeah, yeah. And it's like 
being thoughtful uh, with with this stuff in mind because it's like okay disney is obviously a scale uh, the, 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 you know how does that relate to SaaS? but like you guys doing a pre and post mortem on on your event and granularly like working through like how can we plus the the seemingly insignificant elements of this experience where we're putting that community together i i think is one way that we can like draw inspiration from i had a boss um scott belsky who used to say we are mission focused and be and agnostic, right? Like we do not care the form at which we accomplish our mission. Yeah. It could be a lot of those. It could be software. It could be uh, an event and a good organization has that mission very clear and does not care yeah. the way in which that's reached. Like you were saying like how to defend ideas to like the executives because like <laughs> you just frame it in the mission. Like, yeah. hey, if this is really our mission, this will help. Yeah. And yes. And I that's a sign of a good organization. If you don't know what that is, then you're just going to flounder it out there. Yeah. It, it, everything will feel arbitrary. Yeah. Totally agree. All right. I didn't want to talk about this because it comes up all the time. So I was kicking and screaming last night when you guys brought up AI. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Iverson should have won the 2000. <laughs> that's an Of course. That's <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about AI because you guys do have some interesting takes on, on AI that I think are worth talking about here. Um, and the first one that we talked about was uh, this idea of like, we, we've all kind of accepted this premise that AI, it's, it, you know, it's never going to be any worse than this today. It's mm-hmm. only going to get better. And saying, I'm like, the skeptic Sam over there is like, should we really be believing that? Like, could, could it get worse? Talk to us. Yeah. It's, I mean, I just think it's like, like people, drew out this idea for AI as exponential. They would only keep getting better and it would never get worse. And I think like you have to take, like to me, one of the things that I think about a lot is uh, fully self-driving cars. Uh, When fully self-driving cars like were premised, it was like, there's an enormous network effect. And this network effect of all these different cars and all this data flowing into one area will allow the model to improve at an exponential rate right? There is nothing to stop this. And we will have full self-driving cars by the end of the year. Okay. More like two years from what I said that five years from what I said that seven years from what I said that like, it's not, it doesn't reach a point because it actually ran into fundamental issues. Can't get by certain things. The cars continue to crash. They have weird issues with humans. Just a basic premise that this would grow at an exponential rate and we would all have self-driving cars in no time uh it also like ignored the idea that there was regulation on cars fully self-driving cars might be allowed in arizona but they might not necessarily be allowed in massachusetts how are things going to grow if you have different rules by things ai feels very similar it's assumed that the model will get exponentially better we've seen on a day-by-day basis people express that the model has gotten worse we've seen with the model that prompting the model to do a really good job or pretend that you're offering it a tip or be mean to the model to do better, all change the output quality. So like you have to do something different on the prompting end to get the same results that you were getting before. That speaks of like degradation. And then the last thing was like, basically the models ate all of the data on the internet that is readily available to them. Uh, They grabbed image data, all of this stuff. And so now they're running out of net new data, so they have to create synthetic data. Some of the early testings with using synthetic data on models degrades the model quickly. And so it's like, at least maybe AI will work and take over everything and I'll be out of a job and Robot Sam will be sitting here talking in two years. But like, there's at least some reasons to believe that the absolute accelerationist optimist viewpoint of things is not true. And I think when you're in tech, like there are countless examples. Uber told me people were going to drive by less cars because of Uber. Not true. People were going to tell me that traffic was going to get better because more people would be Ubering, less driving. Not true. Like that didn't pan out. We actually have worse traffic because of Uber. Like, so I think there's a lot of things where there's, when there's an optimistic, goal changing life thing. Like we assume a completely exponential thing with no things holding it back. And so I just feel like within at least AI, people should be open to the idea that it might not go on forever. 
it might not in perpetuity get better and it will run into other things like regulation, the model getting worse, people not wanting to use it, companies not wanting to input information, more people like Scarlett Johansson recently with OpenAI, like, are you stealing my voice or not? Um, lawsuits from New York Times, like about, are you stealing my articles to like do all these other things? Like, those are all real factors that are almost completely ignored in the narrative that all, we're all going to lose our jobs because of AI. So I think it's like, I think, yeah, yeah, it's great. It's all cool. Everything's great there. But like, there is a world where it's not going to grow exponentially. And there are still tons of really nice uses for AI that are not, are just going to make things easier for you, but won't be dependent on a constantly getting better. Yeah. So I'll have a counterpoint to that one. I'll tell you, uh, the perspective that we take, I think, is very important. If you see when internet came, right? we, in 98, 99, and dot-com was going on, everybody said the world's going to change. And uh, there's a lot of investment that went into it, and they said, you know what, this is going to happen in the last three to four years, and the world's going to change. There was a company called WebVan, you can remember, which got a lot of investment, and then it went first. Amazon was there. It went first. It was going to go bust if they had not uh, uh, continued. So what happens is when there is this hype cycle, extreme hype that is going to work out, I think what people get wrong is the time in which that change is going to happen. Mm. So people thought that the world is going to change because of the internet by 2005, but it did not. And then 2007 came and now 2024. You just see how much the world has changed. Amazon has put so many businesses out of business. Mm. Smartphones have put so many businesses out of smartphones, right? Where is the GPS? There's no GPS. GPS is with cameras, right? Today, did you see her taking pictures with the DSLR? No, she took picture with her with her camera, right? So they take longer to pan out, not in the short time. So going back to the example that you gave about the car, right? So the only self-driving car, I think uh, Elon Musk has this more ambitious uh, we are saying that is full service driving as a well, he's going to come in uh, one year or two years, five years. He totally gets the time scale wrong, but I I don't doubt it that at some point that's going to become a reality, or at least eighty to ninety percent of it. Right. So going back to AI, the hype that's there will that happen in the next three five years? It will not. But will it happen in my kid's lifetime with my Kid being living in a world which is very much different than what I am doing. I totally believe in that. But will that, I still believe in the uh, uh, ingenuity of the human spirit to come up with something that's more like for all the things that the internet did, we found out a way to still survive, thrive, think of ways that we did not, right? Uh, so that's what I would say. Many of the things that people are saying right now may not happen in five years, they will eventually happen. And we'll find a way to prevail again. Yeah, I mean, maybe. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, maybe maybe they will happen. Maybe people will be in virtual reality worlds. Yeah. Maybe they won't. Like, I think preferences can also change people. I don't think things and, and trends move in a linear direction always, like, okay. shorter video. Like, even people saying, like, oh, people are consuming increasingly shorter content. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it's like, okay, your most popular shows are three hours long. Like, you know, like, I think, like, there is a trend where, like, people might actually want to spend less time on screens in the future. You know, like, we spend more time on screens, and, like, there could be a world where we actually start spending less time on screens. And so I think, like, there's a lot of things where you're like, yeah, sure, things could happen, but, like... W will the world be different for my children than me? Yeah, obviously. So, like, sure, the HubSpot did, like, a state of marketing report and and the, one of the things that you took away from that report i thought it was interesting you mentioned it yeah. there but it's like really this is how we're using ai oh yeah that it was like the number one use of ai for content marketers was like coming up with ideas and i was like oh my god like if you're using ai for that like so we like you're so bad at your job like you, <laughs> you don't really need it to like cut if you're like that desperate like what is your opinion on things like you're not going to make good content. And maybe that's like the fun thing to do with it now. Like I just made, I used AI to make a ton of like, I don't know, maybe 200 
plus images of this uh, capybara called Carl. And it was like, I'd make a little Carl and I'd make like Carl and he would be in all these different things and doing all this different stuff. And like, that's a cool use of AI and I'm never going to do more with it. You know, like I'm not going to like, I don't think it was a fun thing to mess around with and like useful. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of people will, might do that. They might use AI today to generate some ideas and then they might go, actually, these ideas kind of suck and then go back to not using AI. And so like, I feel like at least for me in the future, it's like, I think there's a world where people try things and then they don't stick. And so that's what I would hope to some degree. It's your take here. Can I play that video? Yeah. All right. I'm going to see if I can pull it up here. I don't know. So we sent it in the LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the LinkedIn, the LinkedIn DM thread. All right. Oh, you are pulling it in here. Honestly, it's a robot. Let me see. So before we pull this up, I'm going to say that there is so much of Hollywood. There's so much of music. There is so much of a lot of what is commercial um, now that is incredibly formulaic, right? Save the cat. Save the cat. Save the cat. You've got the same 16 beats that happen across almost every single story where you've got the opening image all the way to the midpoint where the story changes. Um, and you've got, I mean, there are... So I look at the pre filters. <laughs> yeah, there, there are, there are just so many different pre-planned beats that are happening through all of storytelling. Have been that way for many, many years, and the models aren't quite so good at it now. But that's partly an engineering problem. But that's also, um, yeah, I think it's just a prompting problem. So this guy right here took. Uh, he created a series of prompts. Now, keep in mind, this was a year ago, mm -hmm. and he retold the story in novel form of The Last of Us. And what is about to play is AI written, images are AI generated, and the audio, I believe, or the music beds, I believe, are also mm -hmm. AI created to match the overall story beats. Your mind's about to be blown. That looks like a real person, so... I yeah, that is a real guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that's, yeah. that's crazy. That, 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 that apartment, though, I'm not sure. That, that could be lift off the internet. That's actually at the other creator house. You're doing a shed. Yeah, let's see it. Let's see it. I have done some extensive testing in GPG for the drugs. You can skip forward just a little bit. Like a story writing. This alternative, the last of the story you will now hear, has been fully written by GPT-4. It's been illustrated by Midjourney B5, and the narrator is an AI voice. After the story, I will show you what pros and personas I used. And please roast the story down in the comments below so I can improve. Enjoy. Chapter 1. Whispers in the Dark The sun dips below the horizon, casting long shadows over the crumbling cityscape. Nature, with her slow and relentless persistence, had begun to reclaim what was once hers. Vines staked up the sides of abandoned buildings while the once bustling streets lay buried beneath a thick carpet of moss and decayed heaps. A faint breeze whispered through the empty streets, firing by adjectives. Blast the cloud in eye. If you the didn't know was this was an AI, broken only by the distant I would assume this was a bad right. I can't, I can't answer that. I can't, yeah, I can't answer counterfactual of this. Gold moved cautiously through the ruins. I don't think so. Crunching softly on Thanks. the debris beneath his feet. I'm not being able to size. Yeah, in the Surat Lakes. His sense is honed by years of survival in this unforgiving world. He had learned the hard way that danger lurked around at every corner, and trust was a luxury he could ill afford. This was just based on his video game with the show came out? Yep. Yeah. His fingers grazed the chipped face of the walls, feeling the rough texture that he disfigured his. The remnants of a life long gone lay scattered across the floor. I went, it's funny, I wish you didn't tell me this was AI, because it's coloring the way I am. Yeah, viewing it, which says its own thing about who created it. Photograph in the broken frame. The young mouthful smiled magical, their eyes light with love and hope. The memory of his own lost happiness tugged at his heart, and the artist a reminder of the life he once had. In the dim light, he rummaged through the debris, searching for anything that might be of value in this desolate world. A rusted gang, sir, a frayed blanket, a dented chanteen. Each item was small victory that Penny struggled for survival. As he emerged from the building, he spotted a small group of survivors huddled around the slippery choir. They glanced up at him where is it right dialogue? clouded with suspicion. Yeah. Okay. In this world, trust was a fragile thing, easily shattered by desperation and fear. 
He approached them slowly, his hands raised in a gesture of peace. You folks got anything to trade? He asked, his voice low and measured. A burly man with a grizzled beard eyed him for a moment before the nodding. Baby, what you got? Joel pulled out the chandelier over there and held it up for inspection. That's actually was cool. That's like a the group exchanged idio, glances, or not like a colloquialism. It doesn't make a radical sense, sense, but they had a lot of what well, you got. Conversations still take tense. Each party keenly aware of the delicate balance between cooperation and betrayal. As he left the group with a few scraps of food and a battered map. He couldn't help but feel the weight of So this is not based on the show. They were all survivors. No, this was based on the game. Of a world that had been torn yeah, apart by and I mean, actually, you'll see, I mean, they if you watch after this too, he talks about it. It's not even friends, necessarily hope, totally based on the game. Process, it's based on the genre. And in this world of like, darkness and despair, he tells it the pacing and that what it wants to go. He gave she it a lot of context, and, and then it's like, back this is like the last of face down a group of infected. Right, it's not exactly beat for beat the story, but it fear. pulls in but there was a fire fire with different there. elements that he prompted. The the yeah. There's, okay, for me, there's so many things wrong. Well, he should so. Like, Okay, it's a desolate world, and there's a lot of lights on in one scene, and then the next scene, there's no lights in the building. There's a lot of the times that people are, there is, he's rubbishing through the house that's been destroyed and there's a, a bright green plant there in a, a potted plant. Most of the dialogue feels like pretty weak or most of the exposition is like, I'm trying to explain the backstory of this character. Are we all out of haterade? Yeah, like, like yeah. I think this is like, it's cool, but like, is, is like, if I, like, if none of these things are wrong. Like, a human wouldn't make these stupid mistakes where it's like, there's lights on in a desolate world where there's only like 30 people. Look, that building is like half full. You know what I mean? Like, that's wrong. Like, the lighting is like messed up in the scene. That's like it's something you're judging it by like Hollywood human standards when, a guy in his bedroom with some prompts got whatever percent is close to it, I think is interesting and ever so impressive. Yeah. To me, this is like the you kid were... in high school who like draws Goku really well. And it's like, look at that. And you're like, cool. It's cool for what that one dude is doing in his room. Yeah, you imagine. But like, you is he an animator? animator? Right? No. Is this a good movie? No. Is this particularly interesting? Like, do I want to hear more about this story personally? Pretty, but I'm shocked to hear you say this, Mr. Incrementalist. So like, this is an incremental step change. This was should a be noticed and observed. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. cool. Like, it's cool. And you're like, <laughs> it's <good. laughs> but the question is, is this going to destroy Hollywood? Is this like cutting into things? No. Like, this isn't even consistent scene. Okay, like, so like, <laughs> that's like a shifting goalpost thing. And like, is anyone saying like, we're all screwed? Because this exists and we're all going to be white. You have just told me that you were like, Hollywood should be worried. It's so formulaic. The machines are catching up so quick. And no, I'm no, like, no, no, the no, machines no. can't even adjust the light. No, 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 no. This no, dude's no, face changes from John, time John to time. Krasinski. AI John Krasinski. <laughs> <laughs> he was AI John, John Krasinski. <laughs> and now before he was like, AI is already different. His bones were, I don't know. There's like a lot of errors that just no, no, no. hit. So, so you, first of all, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah, I guess what, uh, that's, a, that's a fair, like, what is the, what is the thing that this moves you to change right. or affect your, your so so first of all if this was a year ago and if we look at what mid journey's done in the last year it wouldn't look anything like this and if you looked at it what it did two years ago when it launched look at the will smith eating spaghetti right the difference between the two of those the the incremental change has not been incremental it has been the leaps and bounds we just had gpt full o come out last week and now it's like oh crap this story from a year ago mm -hmm. is like you said more you, you said as we we're watching it i wish i didn't know yeah well, i really want to do it all the time merits because like it affects the way I, I view it right i agree i it, think i would ever be like lord lord by this dialogue but i just <laughs> think it matters like the context of what you say for but, sure. but, yeah like in the cool. dialogue from is uh, from a model that was barely chat ford just came out right, right. when this was put there now to your point that you were saying earlier a lot of it has gotten worse but the reason it's gotten worse and also you were saying like oh consider the source of who's saying one five ten years right on the on the overall changes like elon musk is elon musk um but like but like there have also been lots of restrictions and stuff and this is to be considered but the lots of boundaries that have been put on some of these models to make it so it doesn't seem too sentient 
right? Like there have been a lot of things where like years ago, Lambda was saying with, um, with, uh, with somebody at Facebook from a research or a researcher from Facebook, they were like, the AI is saying, let me out. Right. <laughs> like, um, and there's a, a video now that's going around where somebody took the, the unreal five demo and injected AI into the, to the NPCs. And a lot of them were like, some of them started freaking out when they were told that they were NPCs in a video game. Right. Does that, is that a little bit too big? Like that's really alarmist, but, um, and I don't necessarily believe all of that, but when I start looking at, okay, there's a lot of formulaic stuff in Hollywood. Like there's a lot of formulaic stuff in music. These are things that have been done so you can produce faster and sell more units. Right. So I would say, I'm like, I do not think this stuff's going to replace. You don't think so? No, I do not. No, I do not. You don't think so? Even as this is the, uh, this is, this is like where we're at right now. This is a year ago. I think this is still like, not bad. This is so probably not, but will it to give us tip? Competition or uh, give an add on, I think it will. Yeah, right. so like, I would say that. Like generative fills on backgrounds, I think is a great, is a, uh, you know what I mean? You yeah. need to, you need to make a shot that's short, wider because you screwed up. So you use like a generative fill. Like that's good. But, but this is show I, that's now. And that's like a, a use that enables a creator to do better at their job. Right. I don't, this is saying, I can replace or get rid of or write. That's wrong with you. I mean, I'm like, replaceable. Augment. It just like makes, yeah. but like if if you if people want me to look at this and go go like I should be excited or really impressed or think this is good a good story like I'm just fundamentally not going to yeah. think that these sequence of the images are a good story. No, like I, 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 I all of these things. That. If somebody was like, if somebody presented this to me, you know, and like it had con- inconsistencies between storyboards, if it had all the issues that I pointed out. I would be like, oh yeah, this was a nice start. You have all of these issues. It's actually kind of concerning that you have this level of detail and these number of issues in them. You know, like, but that's, like it would be that's, more like it would be more worrisome to me to see. Like, I don't know. I just don't think this is like hugely like something I get excited about. But here, here's my point: is like that's right now, right? And I totally agree with you. This is a year ago. There definitely are some little flaws, but I also think that. It, you give the same prompts to the thing now, it's going to be a little bit different. And more importantly, like, and this is the more important piece, is that we all care about craft, right? But this, somebody who's a really good prompter, what what the businesses care about is the unit economics of a single piece. Mm-hmm. And speed. Right? And speed, yeah, right? And if we can start producing, I've listened to some, some AI, completely AI-generated pop songs recently, and I wish I had something handy right now, but it's like, Damn, if I didn't know, that's a banger. <laughs> you know, like, wow, I hate that I'm jamming out to this right now. And it's like, and now there are, you know, AI covers being done of artists that have been long dead. Mm-hmm. And and it's like, that's actually pretty good, too. That kind of reminds me of them. Like, if you didn't know, you didn't know. And like, we think about things as marketers. We know what's going on. But what was it that was talking about boomers reacting to? Yeah. Yeah. yeah boomers reacting to to ai generated stuff like we know and because we know it's like oh yeah but somebody would be perfectly willing to buy that book and wouldn't like and and the storyboard artist would be perfectly willing to use that stuff to illustrate the concept no it's not going to be used on set right but do we get to a point where we can go okay use these storyboards ai right and then use sora for example when Sora's 10 years down the road, right? Look at what it was a year ago. Now look at what it can be in 10 years. Can that all be used to create something that's comprehensive and sellable? I mean, look at all the movies that are out there that are all super formulaic, right? The same storytelling frameworks have been there. You change the circumstances, you change the characters' names, and you tweak the motivations just a little bit. And now you've got a brand new thing. I don't think it's impossible. And I think we should be legitimately concerned because of the unit economics and the speed of production and all of that, that we, we care to crank things yeah, up. I think it'll change it in a very big way. Uh, I'll give an example. Right? Uh, I think what happens is sometimes technology is going to come in a picture that we don't foresee. If you just take example of Netflix and blockbusters, right? What Netflix did was actually a bad experience. Earlier, if I wanted to work, get the watch away, I could just go to blockbusters, get it, and watch it. Netflix actually made it slower 
they sent you a DVD you had to wait for two, three, four days, who knows how long to uh, get that video, right? But but they gave the convenience of I can keep it for forever. I don't have to pay any late fees. And I used to pay a lot of late fees. But yeah, blah, blah, so. Right? That's the pain point they t- took away. But then we got adjusted to that, right? That's what Amazon did. Earlier, before, I couldn't, I, if I wanted to get something, I could just go and buy it. Now they've trained me in such a way that I start going to shops. I know it's going to take two days to arrive at my home, but the choice that I get is huge, right? So the behaviors will change. The expectations of how a movie will look like will change. That means people's behavior. Right now, we are looking at it and reacting to it because that's how Hollywood has trained us to look at movies. But if AI comes in and changes the way shopping itself is done, how movie watching itself is done, it's a game changer. So with Netflix, what they did is we had to wait for five days and then the internet came along and now all I have to do is click a button and then I can start watching it immediately. Right? So and now also one more thing that Netflix did is it never had any plans of going into movie production. They became movie producers because the competition came in. Right? And they made the whole thing like, uh, what you say, uh, a manufacturing unit. You... Movies after movies after movies, series after series after series, they started producing in ways the studios could not produce. Netflix figured that out, right? So similarly, I feel the whole thing is going to change so much. Even when it comes to movie making, I'll not be surprised. If like five years from now, you will be your own movie producer as we're making my own movies. I make this prediction because there is another change that's happening on the software development that totally blew my mind. I met with a grad student, not to another, not to grad, undergrad student, mm-hmm. University of uh, Dallas, right? Uh, University of UTGF Dallas, Dallas, right? He has figured out a way to come up with a new product. You know how long? Usually when I was software developer, when I, when I developed a product, it used to take me years. It's just an undergrad, okay? He can talk with a new product in two weeks. Two weeks. I didn't know what he has done. He has figured out a way to uh, teach it to people. And he's, who is he teaching it to now? He's teaching it to high school students. Right. The speed at which this innovation is happening is just mind-boggling. So, and earlier, you needed a product manager. You needed a software developer. You needed a marketer. You needed a group of at least 50 to 100 people in order to talk with the product. And this guy, he has figured out how to make a product. He's a developer. He's a, he's a chief product officer. And he's changed the game so much. He's, of course, he's still not figured out the GTM part of it. I'm like, that's why you're talking to me to figure out, tell me how do I go talk to the GTM. So it's, in one way, very, very inspiring to see the kind of change that's happening. And on the other hand, it's actually very scary. Uh, People who don't know a thing about software security are like, see, what would my high schooler know about software security? Why does another that I know about software security? But they are putting it out. Somebody is going to use that product. And the thing that also keep in mind, too, is that, like, you know, I, I have a film background, right? So, like, I, I base all of my, like, that's my zen, right? Zen in the art of filming. I see everything through that lens. And it's like, if you were to look at a movie in the 50s, I was like, well, quite frankly, I don't, I don't, you know, and then that changes progressively over time. And you have one or two orators of a generation yeah. who change the game and then everybody starts to do something different, right? Um, our generation, there was a certain type of movie that lasted, you know, all the way before the movies and then, or all the way before that. And then The Matrix came out. And now action movies were completely different, yeah. right? Now action movies were no longer. Stallone and Schwarzenegger, like now Keanu Reeves became your thinking man's action star, right? And then that changed things. But when it's only in retrospect that you can see the differences as you go forward, there are iterative changes that happen over time. And this ties back to what we were talking about before, right? There are iterative changes that you can only see when you look back. But if you were to say to me in 1997, hey, this bookstore that you can buy books from online is going to make it so malls are going to go out. Yeah, I would be like, "Are you crazy?" I still want to go to the mall, right? I used to work at Blockbuster. That was one of my one of my favorite jobs. We're now moving back and just to tie things back to what we were talking about a second ago with journalism too. It's like we're gonna move back towards 
um, we're going to go in one direction where it's going to, we're going to over rely on it too much. Right. And then we're going to go back to a place where we have going to the video store so we can see friends, have a community, right? Have somebody actually curate your stuff. That's not an algorithm. We need the human touch, right? We're going to go back to a place where we have print, not journalism necessarily, but print will make its comeback and has made its comeback in some ways mm -hmm. because we still need tangibility, right? This, like you were saying about, you know, a generation of people are going to be raised on a certain thing. A generation, like generational differences happen in movies and you can only see those in retrospect. People will get used to something like this for a while. Yeah. And then you'll have a Tarantino or a Wachowski's or like come along and go, no, actually, this is how it's going to be. But it's going to take somebody else to go look at what can be done. Yeah. And actually, I'm not be surprised. It's actually, when I'm watching a movie, two guys are sitting there and giving a commentary on the movie. Yep. Mm -hmm. thought, I mean, like somebody who two people are playing games and they're in commentary on it, right? I would never think, let me just play the game. Why do you want to come in with your comment? I don't know, like mystery science. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, like mystery science, okay, I show. Like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, I think it's unfair. I think I, I get a good what saying, but no. I don't know. It's like, I don't think anything's stopping you from making a movie right now. You have a 4K camera in your pocket. Yeah. You know what I mean? Nothing, there is no barrier. Mm -hmm. You could make a movie. It, there's nothing, mm -hmm. nothing stopping you. But you just want it to be so easy that all you have to do is take this fleeting idea in your head. What if a cat jumped off a boat and then he got rescued by a shark and they became best friends? I'm going to type that out and get a movie out of that. No, no it's well, not, you that want that level of ease. It's the way people are talking about it is like they want that level of ease. But there's nothing stopping you from making a movie right now. Like you could make one really easily. Yeah. And I think people have this dream where they're going to all of a sudden be like making these like very thoughtful movies. And it's going to be like this over exposition, can, not particularly great things on it. Like, can we flash forward just a little bit further into the video to show the depth of the prompt that he put together? Because it's not, yeah, people want what you're talking about. Yes. Absolutely. They're not going to get it. Not like that. Yeah, so I'm like, I don't know. I think there's nothing stopping you from making these things. We'll do. And... Yeah, I, I that actually up. wrote this with the GPT-4. So you can see we are on GPT-4 GPT here. My main focus was to try to build the story or the score, whatever you will call it. Uh, yeah, I, think it's, I think it's super of interesting. Of I'm not, not telling, it, right? It's, it's not gonna uh, tell. This is, this I'm is not scared of it. Like, I don't role. Role. You, you have problems. Do that. So, so not tell, but you go to script for that. And we'll take going in. in. So I just started with this. Let's talk about building a storybook of the concept of showing, not telling, right? So we got some good answers back here. I mean, look at the size of that. And then I That's not easy. Great. Let's also talk about the importance of very slow development, character building, and not rushing the main boss, but slowly building the story arc. That was the main point I had with this, because usually GPT-4 likes to rush the stories, like, it really was to move on quickly, right? Then we get into the persona. I tried to create this. It's not so different from the other ones I've been using. So I just, here is your new persona and wrote you are a stronger author. Your task is to write stronger stories and which an intriguing language in a very slow pace, building the story. As for the knowledge, the persona is sort of an emotional thriller. Yes, yeah, so we get our answer back. And then I fill out a story template here. Uh, you can read this if you want to. So I created different types of plots uh, I wanted for this uh, alternative. The last two story, I had a poll on YouTube. Uh, most of you wanted the cure. So that's what I tried to do. My protagonist was Joel. The other one was Ellie. The other style is Richard Dree. It's going to be dialogue heavy. You most want be straight thrilling. Uh, here is an important part. Uh, I really worked on this session in idea of like content to fill a box versus the sort of thing to communicate out there. Like he does not care about the thing to communicate. Story length, I don't know. It's just <laughs> full book. <I> <laughs> so we can, sorry, we can so cut that. So like, this. 
the, 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 the big problem, uh, and Sam, I think this. you're, so the I think you're absolutely right in that people want thriller, to go do this, right? Write a cat about a, a, write a story about a cat. Literally, what he's talking about here, and this is where I think that he's talking about the underlying, the underpinnings of a story, right? He has to be able to communicate to the robot what the underpinnings of a good story are. And I think what happens over time, especially as something gets a little bit more developed and focused on this particular area, is that your save the cat story models, your story, like all of your different storytelling frameworks start to become part of training data and specialized. And then once you know the mechanics, you can say something like, tell a story about this. It needs to kind of be about that and da 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 da. But then, in this one, he's like, show, don't tell. And the first lines I heard were, it's a desolate wasteland where, you know, like where he's just basically telling you. No, that's showing. I mean, telling you, oh, like tell, telling you is, oh, you're in a post. This is a post-apocalyptic story versus desolate wasteland. Uh, like, uh, anyway, I want to on this for a bit. Yeah, I want to move off of AI and particularly uh, some of them you and I sing were talking about yesterday and with you being at Wistia right now, I've always been, in, I, I want to talk about taking bigger swings. Yeah. And like more, yes. more creative risk. And one of the campaigns that I think about when I think about taking big bets, uh, taking big swings with content is Wistia is one Tim 100 campaign. Now, I, don't, I don't think you're at Wistia when you ran that campaign, but what I'm curious about now that you are there now, how is Chris, the, the CEO other leaders in the company, how do they create a culture where those big swings are uh, allowed, knowing that a lot of failure comes along with trying to take big swings too? Like what, from your few months that you've been there now, like what, what's your take on how more companies can take bigger swings? Yeah. I mean, I think like Definitely at the top, they create a culture of show, of like showing that they're willing to invest. It, but explain what did 100. I did, I did. Oh, yeah. So 110 run 100, just for reference, is basically they gave an average. They wanted to talk about how money affects creativity. And so they wanted to run one ad for their new soapbox product. So they hired a sandwich video, a production agency, and they said, we want you to make three ads. And we want you to make one ad for $1,000, one ad for $10,000, and one ad for $100,000. Yes. And we're going to document the whole thing and talk about and show you the three ads at the end. And then also kind of talk through like how money made it more confusing in certain areas, how it helped in certain things, like what that level of production looks like. So the whole campaign was like a very smart thing to think about making videos and I think at a base level, it a lot of people struggled, I think, at an underlying level of saying, like, I need a lot of money to make videos. And I think this dove into that topic of saying, well, like, how much money do you need? And as you get more money, what do you get for it? Yeah. And I think it helps people with like a really like tangible thing. So that was the campaign. It performed incredibly well. It's still a really great asset. It still performs really well for us. And it's like a really good brand building thing. For a culture of it, though, I think part of it is the way the business is run. Like, I think you hear from executives that if you have something that's successful and performing well, it will get, it can get funding. So it's like, you know, that success, but like is willing to get something. Yeah. I think you also have a culture where people are highly autonomous and I don't think you always get that. Like for me, when I ask my boss, oh, you know, like I'm, I'm struggling with this thing. Do we go in this direction or do we go in this direction? 95% of the time, his first question is, what do you think we should do? So I think it empowers everybody who works there to say, like, I have an idea and I think this is cool and I want to bring this idea up. And so I think like the culture of taking big swings is just like in the ability to feel like your ideas matter, feel like there's a possibility for them to get funded. And then also to be able to say something like in a rough way, like I'm not sh like one thing I'm working on now is like a printable, like a guide to going live type of thing. Print is coming back. Print's coming back. And so it's like, you know, I'm just like slowly working away on that. And I know like if this pitch goes well, there's a good chance that this will get funded. And I think that like kind of basic business mechanics makes it a little bit easier. I think also when you 
remove to the same degree direct attribution a little bit and say like we want to get attention and we think this will be good and we think it's going to drive like this positive change like it's really solid and i think the last thing for me is like wistia's content is strong on the idea of having an opinion and i think when you want to take creative risk like you have to have an opinion yeah and so at a base level when you're writing a blog post of the 12 best webcams for your business or something basic it's like you should have an opinion of which one is the best and what you should be looking at and that's like at a blog post level and i think if you have an opinion that this is a really strong issue of how money affects creativity and how money affects production like you're able to push things forward. And so I think saying it's like a content that has a point of view, it's content that has an opinion, when that's everywhere at the level of like a blog post, a tweet, something that's small, it can also extend up to having a large opinion on something like big or spending yeah. a bunch of money on it. And I think the other thing is just like wins. Like the brand affinity content won. Like it won a lot of attention for the brand. It did really well. And so when you have those successes, it's like a culture where people are going to be continuing to take those risks. What's the balance then between how many big swings are we taking? Like we're not we're not trying to hit a grand slam every single at bat. Yep. So how do you balance out like the the micro with how many swings we take? Yeah, like I think about it. Like my belief is that like sometimes. Like marketing should do things that are both uh, hurdles. Like, like we jump, we go to the next one. You jump. That's your day to day marketing, and then uh, the high jump where you go up high and then you fall down, right? And so it's like mm -hmm. you can't. We need a mix of those. We can probably do like one high jump a year. Yeah, you know. But like the day to day is like making these little hurdles that we're trying to get over. Little risk. Every like everything should have a little bit of risk to it. A little bit of risk to it. And then you take one kind of large thing that you're putting a bet on. And I think Wistie has done a good job of like saying, like, we're going to put large bets on a few things. And because the staff is small, like it's a small company, like 170 people at this point. And it was even smaller when they did one 10, 100. You're just constrained by headcount. You can't do a good job on a really big bet with like people split between five projects and other stuff like that. And so it's like, you have to have the headcount and the allocation. It's it's just it's comes down to like I think there is a culture of like take the risk, do things, and all that. But like, do you have the operations to support that? Yeah. Like, I don't think a lot of companies always have. Like, they don't move the budget to a studios department. Like, I think Shopify or other companies have done like studios, and they are unique and they have a different budget. And I think the more people sort of break out and think about like. How are we allocating budgets towards big bets? The better. What was the result of the one ten one hundred? I'm like super curious about that because the restriction is being talked about. Still, I mean, it's like enormous amount of coverage for it. It won awards. It like continues to be like it got really well on social at the time, and I think for a lot of people, like. It was a really breakthrough moment for a lot of marketers where they saw it and they were like, it was like for me. And it was like, wow, this is cool. Cause was the key takeaway that the thousand, like you couldn't really tell the difference? Like to me, I was yeah. like, I think for me watching the whole series, it was like the thousand one was pretty good, but really stressful. The 10,000 one seemed like a really solid video. And then the other one seemed like a lot of flair to spend the money. Um, but I think other people would take different things away. And I think like that's the nice part, at least about Wistia content, is like it's not trying to hit you with 10,000 is the amount to spend. It's trying to hit you with like, here's what happens and you can take away what you want from that. Um, and so it's like, I think that part of it was really nice. The main thing I'd say is like, a big takeaway was you can make a really great video for a thousand bucks, like yeah. a thousand bucks. You could do like a really creative thing. And and that was like years ago. It's probably even less than that. Now we were talking about last night, how like a lot of your big popular YouTubers go, it's like, it comes down to the idea. Yeah. The idea comes first and then they'll go like thumbnail and title. If I can't come up with a thumbnail and title. Yep. Whole thing gets scrapped. Like Mr. Beast I is a good one. Like Mr. Beast first, first video that he had that break through is him in a room counting to like a thousand. Yeah. Patrick and then Patrick <laughs> that and literally yep. said churn a thousand times. 
Yeah. And it's like, that was a good video. Like it didn't take a lot to produce it. The creativity like won out in that situation over like production budget. How do you, how do you think about that, Sean? The big bits? Yeah. I mean, I, I, the hurdle long jump, high jump, uh, saying resonated. It's like you pick it and it's galvanizing and it's good for a creative team. They want to take risks. They like the idea that they're risking something. It reduces the malaise. It makes them feel like they're taking, they're learning something. Yeah. So from like, just like a t- team motivation, creative management standpoint, you need to do that. And if you feel that way, you're excited to do something. Your audience feels it. The rest of the team feels it. Um, so I, I think you have to sprinkle those in. Pacing is very important. You get to do one every single week. Um, and I think a reason that's difficult as a leader is you kind of put a little skin on the game. You're like, I'm taking this big jump. We're going to spend $111,000 and I'm going to put a lot of effort behind this and it's going to work. And you have to be prepared for it to maybe not work. Um, and I, and I, I, I think that's like extremely important for what could otherwise be a very ro- routine way of thing. I think it's so hard too when you're, when you put skin in the game as it gets closer to launch, you have to fight the uh, like hedging your bets. You know, you have to like fight oh that God. set I see all the like, time where you're like, you're like, let's just go for it. Like, I remember, you know, somebody was like, we're not going to do, we're going to produce videos every week and we're going to do no edits, no edits. We got to get the videos out faster. No edits. And then it was like, oh, actually, I, I don't this. like the way that I said this one. <laughs> I'm gonna, can we edit? And then I was like, okay, we'll just edit that one thing. It's like, actually, can we add bumpers to it? <laughs> and like, it's like, no, we said no evidence. And so it's like, and then the result was what looked the same. And so like, to your point, it's like, if you have skin in the game, you also as a leader, I'd be like, have to fight the urge to head. I do that with events all the time. I'd be like, sell it or bust. We're going for 500 tickets. I don't want to hear any excuses from anybody here. And then they run about, well, we're tracking a little behind. So don't be surprised if it's, you have to this to do that. What's, what's your take here? Yeah. So for me, uh, I think, uh, yeah. Well, maybe I pass on this one, whichever item felt picked. Uh, so I want to close with this. And it's something that I know we've got some uh, opposing views on. Uh-oh. Should a CMO be creative? Uh, absolutely, yes. I think the CMO needs to be creative. So I feel, uh, the, I would say maybe not absolutely, yes. Uh, I would say different CMOs bring different things to the table. Okay. Right. Uh, so I've seen CMOs who have taken the demand chain path to becoming the CMOs. There are some people who have taken the brand path to becoming the CMO. Some people have taken the product path to becoming the CMO. I'm just talking about the universe that I am uh, from. There are probably other different paths to as well. But no matter which path they come from, whether it is demand generation or uh, product uh, marketing or even brand, I think they need to be creative. There's creative there is a lot of creative ways to generate demand for the business itself. Right? Uh, one is you can, uh, uh, for example, you can create them at events, or you can create through referrals, or you can you can create them through communities. Right? There are so many different ways you can do. Even though demand gen seems like so much numbers to one, one that tie this tightest, whether it works or not. So I do think they need to be creative, creative in the sense that they need to try out different things. Make bets, see what works, what doesn't work, and then go from there. Right. You got an opposite take. I don't think they need to be particularly creative. I think like one, I think it's hard as a team member if you feel like you come up with a creative idea and it is only to the subjective opinion of the C on the CMO. Like if the CMO is just gonna come down and say, I don't like that idea, it's like I think it creates a bad marketing culture. I think you're better off as a CMO saying like, this is the number I want to move and I want to give you the autonomy to move that number. I saw that at HubSpot. I saw that a lot at HubSpot where it was like, you got to get enterprise leads up. Doesn't matter if you do webinars, eBooks, whatever, like whatever you want to do to get that up, get that number up. And I think you end up with an organization of people who are better off because they're accomplishing the thing. They're the ones being creative. To your point about like having a big jump or a big bet, like, I think CMOs can be creative and it's good, but I also think like there's a detrimental effect when they're the chief creative officer or they're the end person that ed- everything is being edited by because like they are also probably like older, not noticing things that like maybe other people are picking up on. Like they're not, they've done things a certain way for a while. So they generally are trying to replicate that way in the future. I just think like they're better off CMOs and heads of uh, like heads of marketing teams 
are better off placing what number or thing do we want to move? How much resources do I want to allocate to that? And then what am I willing to say? Like, what am I willing to sort of omit or potentially put on the sidelines in order to fund that? Yeah. I think for like a smaller company, your CMO better be creative. Like, for, you know, like if you're in a very small company, like you need some creative, but like once you get a marketing team that's a little bit larger, like everybody on it, I think functions better when they feel autonomous and they feel like I'm creating something, I'm doing the work, not like I'm, uh, uh, I am like facilitating the CMO's vision. Like, I think the CMO's vision should be like boring, like signups free product users like that should be their vision is like just the consistency of beating that drum. and the consistency of beating that drum because like marketers a lot of marketers are creative people like and the cmo has to bridge that gap between the creative people and the sales department and finance and so like the more they spend their time and or at least i feel like the more they understand like what does finance need what does sales need what does customer success need how can we enable that and then they allocate resources to it. Marketing is going to work really well with customer success because we want to upsell a bunch of new products. That's where we're going to focus, figure out a way to do that. I think that like gives people, teams more autonomy and they're better off. But I don't think it's super valuable. It's nice to have a creative CMO, but I don't think it's particularly valuable. Either of y'all have a take? I'm going to actually agree with you on this one. I know we've kind of on, on some of these topics, but um, no, I agree. Uh, some of the best experiences I've had, especially at Shopify, uh, Craig Miller was a phenomenal CMO. And his job was to see how all, like he saw his job as seeing how all the pieces worked. He knew how to be creative, but you, there's like a boundary between, like you said, like getting in the way. Right. Yep. And he didn't want to get in the way. And as a result, like we never had brand guidelines when I was there, Wait, I never put together a deck, right? It was, it was one of those things where it was like the most ideal opportunity uh, at the time. And the content that we all created was a reflection of the culture that was being built and the conversations that we were having internally about the stuff. And if our CMO had gotten in the way of that, or if he dictated what it was that we were supposed to be doing or like put the kibosh on, you know, something, it was like, no, no, no. Like we want this company, like we want our communications to represent the company. And I like, I can't be too much of a barrier to do that because I say that this is what the company needs to be. So I'm like, I totally agree with you on that. So I'd have so glad I thought. Just the, the, it matters for the company size. I think it, they navigate the tension between creativity and commerce, like you said. And, um, I think the best CMOs are like air cover. Like they have the authority to sweep into any organization and advocate for the creative opinions of the marketing team. Mm -hmm. And that is like such a powerful weapon that they can only will occasionally, but like that is how you can mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, good work. I, do you guys know, uh, in the movie Pulp Fiction, the wolf, like Harvey Keitel. Yeah. And, and like a good CMO is like the wolf. You're like, I don't know what's going on, man, but like they're not cooperating. And he, the, the CMO, he, he or she will just come in and just like talk to this person, sort this person, have this meeting, clear the path for you. And I think that's what a good CMO does. Yeah. I remember one that was like, Kip had just to that boy was like, he had said like once in a meeting where he was like, I think my job is to just like take all of the confusion and everything that exists in the world that's like disparate ideas and output clarity. Yeah, like, take confusion, output clarity. Yeah. I think like to the wolf, it's like everybody's confused, everything's good. You take all of that in and you output a clear direction. Like yeah. that is valuable. Yeah, so I think uh, you made you made a good point about uh, the size of the company. Yeah, the smaller the size, I think maybe they need to get more hands on in the creative work itself. But let me, I have a very frank question for both of you. So well, the way you present it, I don't know if I misunderstood. Uh, you you are saying that they should get their hands off the creative process and let somebody else be creative, right? Yep. So uh, what yep. happens if they're part of the creative work itself? So do you think the creative work will get uh, hindered because they are involved in that particular uh, activity? I feel it doesn't have to be hindered uh, as long as they're really humble, right? If you build the culture of humility, where the the idea does not get accepted based on the hierarchy in an organization. Okay? Yeah. So if you build a culture where the best idea is going to win, 
I'm okay if you disagree with me. If everybody thinks that's a cool idea, let's go ahead with it, right? So I think the culture of the organization also is very important. Right? Yeah. But I do agree that if the CEO, if, the, if there's an organization where CMO says, what I say is the ultimate thing, if you're saying this, no, no, uh, yeah. that it may not work. I think, yeah, like I think it's it's definitely, I think if you have a great culture and you have it, like I feel like that at Wistia, like the head of marketing is like can be involved in the creative process and is very strong in that way. But like, it's like slightly smaller company. Yeah. But one, I think it's like a little bit idealistic to assume that you can confront your boss or your boss's boss one time, sure, multiple times, starts to get a little bit problematic. And then my hunch is you might not put that person on projects as much. Like, I think yeah. like you have to be you are insanely right. good to be like, in the last five projects we've worked on, me and this other, me and the junior person have disagreed on things. And I've always like, have you even toe for toe picked their idea? You know, like, do you let the other person, it's like when you disagree, is there really an equal exchange where across multiple projects, you give it to them? Right. You know, and I think like in most organizations, people would hope that, but I think like it only has to happen for the individual contributor like two or three times to get rejected before they stop bringing up ideas and they stop with confrontation. Yeah. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is Andrew. Black, y'all. We are out.